welcome to the Power Platform Show. Full show notes for this episode can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 278. Before we chat with today's guest, here's a quick message from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by ISV Connected. If you're an ISV, you need to check out isvconnected.com. It's a private ISV members only community that recently launched with the sole purpose of making ISV successful. Yes, navigating the Microsoft ISV landscape is easier when you're doing it with friends. Sign up today at isvconnected.com. Now let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from Seattle in the USA. He has a bachelor's degree in international business. He's a ProSci certified change manager. You can find him on Twitter at Greg Gee. That's Greg, G-E-E-03 or 03. Greg Grant, welcome to the show. Very good. Last name doesn't have an R in it, though. Tricky. You may want to you may want to hit that last line again. You're saying it's Greg Gant. Yeah, it's so easy to throw it in there, and it's easy even to read it like that. Like I that. I did. I just read it in. You know, I'm I'm yeah. co- I'm cool with that. Like <laughs> often I do these intros right, and people go, Ah, oh, yeah, you got that wrong. You got that wrong, and it gives my <laughs> listeners a bit of a laugh to see that uh, I, I don't always uh, pronounce things correctly. It's my Kiwi accent as well. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> So tell me, you're in Seattle. Uh, you know, we just heard the weather forecast that you're in for the biggest snow dump of your life today uh, that, that we're recording this. How many times uh, has this happened for you in Seattle? Yeah. So, Mark, first, thanks for uh, having me on the show. Really excited to do this. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I am. Uh, this will be the first for me. This is my first winter in this area. And um, I'm, I'm interested to see how it goes. It looks like it's going to be snowing for the next week straight. And uh, as someone who's lived in Florida, Texas, and California, uh, you know, all very, very warm and no snow. Oh, this will be an interesting experience to say the least. Wow. And uh, if it's going to snow for a week, I assume you're not going to be going out and about anywhere. I'm, I'm bundled up. I hit the grocery store last night. I'm ready to uh, hunker down. I've got plenty of cocktails and uh, snacks. So life should be good here. I, you don't need to worry about me from across the uh, ocean here. <laughs> Excellent. Now tell me about, yeah, well, it's midsummer here, so I'm getting 30 degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. I can't, I can't convert that quickly for you. But um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm pretty much sweating at the moment. It's that hot. So it's it's definitely <laughs> the opposite extremes in the uh, various yeah. hemispheres. You mentioned cocktails, and I'm a big fan of cocktails. What's your, what's your favorite drop? So for winters, I like a good Manhattan. Nice. That's key number one for me. And then I'm I've, I'm going to do a little experiment to try to make like a spiked eggnog. I don't know if you've done that before, but this will be a first one for me, like some cognac, eggnog, cinnamon. I make it every year. Eggnog every year. Oh, okay. it's, it's my family tradition, and I'm pretty much the only one that drinks it. Um, but yeah, I, I use brandy and uh, and dark rum, uh, my two two spirits nice. that I add to it, and you know, a couple of eggs, cream, full cream, milk, uh, yep. vanilla pod. You know, that's uh, and then I, you know. Whiz it all up and then put it in the fridge overnight and then serve it the next day with uh, a bit of, um, uh, what is it, nutmeg on it, yeah. Yeah, well, I may try to poach the recipe from you afterwards here. So Sounds good, <laughs> sounds good. I'll put it in the show notes if the guests want to yeah. yeah, There you go, themselves. everybody can benefit and from it. Everyone yeah. can benefit, absolutely. <laughs> so so in this episode, you know, I'm interested in talking about organizational change. And, and before we jump into that, tell me, and, and really, you, you know, a lot of the listeners uh, on this are involved in going into organizations, building software. Uh, traditionally, as in the, the, the listeners are building on the Microsoft Power Platform. So they're building apps using Microsoft technologies. I know some of your background was at Hitachi, and I, I see you've even... Um, was it core motives that you're back in at some point? Did I see customer effective? Customer, yeah, effective, customer effective. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I get them. Yep. I get them mixed up. But I saw that on a blog post from eons ago when I was researching <laughs> you, and I was like, I did not know that you came from there as well, as in yeah. 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 Even uh, all the way back then, I think that blog post you probably found was even focused on change management and adoption 10 years ago, but it was using Dynamics 4.0 CRM dashboards. So different story. And I think it's worth mentioning because you, your listeners might be going, what the heck is this guy doing on a Power Platform show? My whole background has been in the Dynamics stack going all the way back to 1.2 and really spent a lot of time trying to 
uh, well, successfully deploying Dynamics implementations, but struggling in my attempts to get people to use the dang things. And so my, I, I guess it probably started for me five or six years ago. I was running a practice in LA focused on Dynamics implementations, mostly SMB, honestly, to 10 users to 50 users. And my whole focus shifted to how do I keep these things as easy to use as possible. So that's when I started really getting obsessed with like the the human centered design concept, which is so so trendy right now. And then secondly, I started thinking about after we deploy these, how what can I do better to get the users to want to use these systems? And that started for me, like I said, uh, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago. And then when I went to Itachi, I was focused on much larger implementations, uh, but the the obsession stayed. And it really did become an obsession. I, I started thinking more about usage and adoption than I did building requirements, testing. I mean, for me, it was all about let's make sure people are going to use this. Um, and so it's it's really become kind of my thing, even as I've moved maybe away from the Power Platform. I say that I'm, I'm still doing projects that involve Dynamics, Power Platform, you know, earmuffs, but even Salesforce and some of the Amazon stack. But that, that obsession for usage and consumption, especially thinking about cloud applications, has uh, stayed top of mind for me ever since. So, so interesting is in back in 2014, 15, probably in 2013, actually, is when I first came across the idea of, as in, uh, sorry, a cost, a process specifically. Uh, I moved to Australia and the colleague that sat next to me was a process trainer and uh, in our office. And so I said, you know, sell me on this, you know, like <laughs> how could I be using it in all the, you know, Microsoft biz apps type projects I was involved in. And he just took me through a couple of principles and the light came on for me and I was hooked, you know, because yep. I'd seen so many software projects that were, they, they started out with good intentions, but when the users got hold of them, the people that were, the stuff was built for, they just, the adoption didn't happen. And like you had created a much better mousetrap. You had created a much better experience for them. But what human nature is to stick with what you know rather than sometimes what is better or what might be hard to start with but will create a better future. What was yeah. that kind of catalyst or turning point for you? I use the word catalyst because that's Microsoft's uh, brand <laughs> yeah. for HCD, right, yeah. that they're doing internally. I didn't mean to. That was just a, a slip of the tongue. But um, uh, what was that, yeah, that tipping point where you said, you know, it's not just about implementing software. It's around really you, people need to – to adopt and actually they need to take, you know, that that central ownership as a as an in user of a piece of technology and and use it because it makes their life better and they feel more productive, that type of thing. Yeah, I, I'd say there's really two points. Um, one, like a lot of us, came from an implementation very similar to what you just described with the mousetrap example that didn't work the way we thought it was going to. And not from a technical perspective, right? We built, it was a big customer, um, a manufacturing firm. We really had consolidated 30 or 40 Lotus Notes applications into Dynamics. I think it was 2013 at the time. And it, I mean, this thing was beautiful, Mark. It was the system. We had, we had custom app dev sitting on top of it that saved the, it was about 500 users saved them so much time, it was going to revolutionize their workflow. Like their life was going to, just going to be so much improved doing a call report uh, in 10 seconds compared to 20 minutes before writing it on paper, putting it next to their monitor, you know, all the things we see and hear about couldn't get anybody to use it. Right. And, and I, I really spent some time. I practically was living on site with this customer at the time. And we spent a lot of time thinking, huh, what do we miss, right? right? Let's go through our requirements again. Here were the goals we did. We built this mousetrap that got all the goals accomplished. And I started realizing it was the people side of the change. They didn't know why they were getting a new mousetrap. They had no idea they wanted a new mousetrap. That 20-minute process that we were trying to make so efficient, which we did, it didn't actually bother them that much. So we found out once we really started talking to them from a design perspective that they use those 20 minutes to really sponge in the notes that they took from the customer call. Um, and our whole little cool mousetrap we built was more about getting the executives and the managers the readouts of those notes rather than giving the 
the person that same experience. And so I, I, that, that's when the light bulb hit for me initially. I, I, I thought, voila, this is, we should have been so focused on this part first, thinking about what we can do to actually get folks in alignment with our technology side of the process. Um, and that was key. The second piece, I think, is when I, I mentioned in Los Angeles, I was running a practice there. And so I was getting a lot more face time with executives, C-levels, SVPs of my customers, right? I was getting to sit with them and kind of understand their drivers for why they would want to take on a risky CRM project. Because very few people actually want to do that, right? They, something has triggered them to, to want to do a CRM implementation. And <clears throat> talking to them, when I would start to ask them, like, hey, what's keeping you up at night about this thing? I mean, these are expensive. Dynamics is pricey. Salesforce is pricey. Uh, there's a lot of risk and technical debt of implementation failures, all these things. And they're saying, no, Greg, the whole r- issue here, which I, I, it's such a simple concept, but I'd never thought about it, is that I'm, it's consumption economics. I'm going to be paying licenses for the cloud, moving data. I'll have Azure storage. I'll have all this stuff in the cloud that I'm being charged to use it, right? And if I don't use it, I'm still paying. It still costs me money. So how do I make sure when I go to my leadership and ask them for funding to build them this project that we're going to get a return on the investment by people actually using the software? And what that did for me, that this is really what changed the way I thought about it, is I, I then connected those dots. Yes, getting adoption is key. We want people to use the stuff we build. Absolutely. But there's a real fiscal impact tied to that, that if we don't connect those dots, well, probably a short-lived customer, they're unhappy with the platform, and most likely you're kind of one and done in there. And I realized I need to take that same obsession, use it over here, and start getting uh, real value returned to the customers by making sure those licenses and the, the storage and all those things were going to be going to be utilized. How do you answer the question when, <clears throat> you know, and I've heard it many times, particularly from salespeople selling technology, and they will say, uh, the customer won't pay for change management. They, they're, yeah. they're, just, they're just outlaying for the software. They're not interested in paying for the change management. Now, I, one, I see, first of all, probably the sales uh, individual has not actually uh, pitched it. They don't know it. They think it's uh, a dr- they don't they don't believe in it, right? And so, a, 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 somebody selling is never going to do well necessarily selling a product they don't believe in. Um, yeah. And so, but how do you address that if the customer is actually saying that or to the potential salesperson saying, um, you know, the customer won't pay for it or not interested? How do you kind of show the value of why really, in a lot of cases, there's no point point doing the software project unless, you know, change is is integral part from the get-go that everybody's bought on the journey, that you've got executive buy-in, that it's a, you know, a company-wide initiative that everyone's a part of and driving for the outcome. Yeah, a terrifying thought, number one. <laughs> you know, but so here's a couple things that I think about. Number one, and this is a uh, this is a sort of here big statement for your show. OCM is a bad word. Okay, it really is. Because unfortunately, it's been done so poorly by our customers. And frankly, us partners as implementers, very few of us actually get what it does. And it's a con- continuously changing ecosystem. But that's the big, big, bold statement. OCM is a bad word. And, and you're meaning Most, organizational transformation pre- uh, management, right? Yeah, it, it, totally. Absolutely. Organizational because, change management. Yeah. And thank you for that. It, and that's because in, in our customers' minds, they've they've been sold change management in the past. They've been sold pro-sci methodology deliverables. They've been They've had internal partners that have told them they're going to do this for them, and it doesn't actually change the outputs of their project, most likely, or probably more likely, is they didn't realize the value. They they just, you know, it was part of it. It was an extra headache to manage, uh, more deliverables to check, and maybe it made a difference. Maybe it didn't. Hard to tell. So what I try to do here, number one, is we have to align more closely to the business objectives of the customer. And this is what I tell my practice today all the time is we have to be, when we think about change management, we need to be likening it to how do we 
achieve the business objectives for the customer through adoption, right? And and let's use a, some sequence of those words instead of change management, because frankly, if a customer says that, you can try to put as much lipstick on change management you want to, they're not going to take it, right? So you've got to shift your approach and say, look, these four deliverables, here's exactly how they relate to the business objectives that you want. The second piece is, and I can't take credit for this. I, I, it's something p- plastered all over my uh, desk so that I remember our customers buy from us the way our customers want to buy from us, right? So if that customer is, you know, if they're a motivated factor for coming into us and asking for a dynamics project is a business objective, we need to make sure that's what we're preaching. We don't even need to call out change management. We just need to know that, that that's part of the, that's how we're going to achieve what we need to do. And from, from there, getting into the execution side, there's a bunch of different things, right? Maybe it isn't a dedicated change management resource. Maybe it's uh, embedded deliverables into the project methodology, or maybe it's a, it's a principal consultant that's leading some of that effort. Um, in line with the with the actual delivery of the CRM system. Mm-hmm. So, and that totally makes sense. In other words, you're not really putting a label on it. You allow you're you're just this is part of how you deliver projects. It's built in. It's baked into the the entire deliverable. Is that what you say? A hundred percent. It's not easy to do to to get to that point where it it just blends in. But what we're you know like and you you called it. But you said I think five or six years ago your neighbor there that the office was a pro sci guy gal there's that got such a buzz move a couple years ago where ocm was the ticket oh gosh we just found the secret potion of why we've been building crm systems and other applications for 10 years that nobody used we we weren't doing ocm so then what happened is you had an oversaturation of ocm delivery it's not much different than the microsoft implementation ecosystem 10 12 years ago when all of a sudden it was just flooded with with CRM implementers, and unfortunately, it meant the overall quality of delivery went down across the board and, and kind of hurt things. OCM was the same. Everyone was practicing OCM. Everyone was building a practice. So it is actually a bad word, and in the approach for a salesperson to go in and say, here's your project. You see this line below. That's your project manager, and then that next line below is your change management cost. It'll, it just won't work. I, I don't often side with salespeople, but in that case, I'll, I'll come in and say, you're absolutely right. we got to think of a different approach. Yeah. Interesting. So if we play this forward, right, and trends happening in the industry right now, right in the middle, I feel that, particularly, I suppose, in the Microsoft ecosystem, Catalyst, um, which is, you know, Microsoft's interpretation, you know, for delivering um, outcomes, are, which is very strongly linked to human-centered design, HCD, yep. Double Diamond, uh, Agile, uh, all these type of um, uh, practices. And back in, you know, it would have been 2015, I think I started incorporating that into my practice in Australia. We had a, a bunch of folks that were, you know, everything from ex-Disney cartoonists to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we we did the big war rooms where we, we bought the customer and did stand-ups and post-it notes and customer journey mapping and all these type of things and had phenomenal outcome. But I'm wondering now you see all the partners jumping in and going, hey, I need to be Catalyst. We need to have Catalyst or, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you know, this is a whole different area of soft skills, not tech skill. It's very soft skill. It's very yeah. touchy, feely, engaging, emotional. And can a traditional tech type partner, uh, unless they totally resource their business differently, do that? And and is it just the current wave that we're on, like change management was four, five, six years ago? Yeah. I, so a couple things. I, to preface, I, I love the Catalyst program. I think it's fantastic. And when I was um, running the you know practices over at Itachi, I was very excited about what was coming and I participated in all the trainings. And I think there's something there that it is a wave, but it's not a wave that's going to be commoditized the way C- building a workflow in CRM was 15 years ago or the way change management you know, was three to five years ago. It's the overall focus on the human part of it, right? So Catalyst, it brings together change management and all the soft components of thinking about the people side of the implementation, 
Um, so really looking at ProSci, and it's awesome that the partnership that Microsoft has done there is fantastic. But then also bringing in the overall, the HCD component, the human-centered design, which frankly is is a different skill set. And I think what we're going to have to see is our big partners, our big implementation partners are going to have to start thinking about that type of skill set, which traditionally was more of an app dev type partner skill set. And I think it's going to become really relevant for uh, all implementations because everything weaves together, right? The, the cloud consumption, the change management, and the HCD, it all becomes one single value stream when thinking about implementations. Yeah, so true, so true. So, you know, in your experience and, and the years you've been operating in the space, both in Microsoft Partner Land and then in, in your current endeavors, what have kind of been some key turning points in your thinking and and, and how it's affected successful delivery um, of, of the projects you've done with customers? Yeah, so I've, there's a few. Um I'll give a I'll give a specific one that I hope maybe your listeners can take and, and apply some of these concepts. Um, I guess uh, probably six and a half seven years ago, I got to do an implementation with a customer. They're still around. They're a media uh, multimedia. They do magazines, websites, and it's all centered around uh, weddings and engagements and life events. Um, having a kiddo for the first time. Lots of Cool things like that. The interesting thing about this, we were implementing CRM for them, Dynamic CRM, I believe it was 2011, on-prem, obviously. And if you think about the nature of this business, they 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 don't have a problem with adoption things, right? I mean, if they roll out a magazine, people are getting married. They want to learn as much as possible. They're buying all their stuff. They're registering on their websites. And so it brought this really unique perspective to our implementation because our, our executive stakeholders over there that were plugged into our project, that's all they cared about was like, hey, if we're really good at this for our customers, we certainly need to be good at it for our employees. And whatever we build them needs to, needs to be focused around the, the adoption and the usage. And I said, hey, that's great. How do we do that? And I remember the executive, I think he was senior VP of Texas. It was an Austin company. And we're all on site back when those days were possible, hopefully coming soon again. But we're all on site. He rolls up his sleeves, literally says, Greg, it's it's three steps. Super simple. And I'm like, oh, hold on. <laughs> Let me get my notepad here. Let me write this down real quick. And he says, first step, super easy. Whatever you guys build me, I want it to be where my employees are. So if it's if they work from their computer and they're an, a designer, a web designer, Let's make sure we give them the CRM system on their computer. If, if they're on the road and going into Macy's trying to sell ad spots, well, dang it, they need CRM sitting with them on their phone, period. Simple as that. Okay. Principle one, super easy. That makes a lot of sense. Principle two was we have to be able to learn something from CRM. And, and that one was interesting to me because I think sometimes we forget that CRM or, or any application that we're building is not just a repository of data, right? It, and so they were really big. If someone gives me one thing into CRM, let's say that same salesperson goes into Macy's, is trying to sell an ad spot, meets with someone, takes some notes. If that person hits a button and sends that note into Dynamics, it should teach them two things. That was their rule. Give one, get two. And so we started thinking about that. Okay, well, what would a salesperson need? Right. And then now you don't realize it, but all of a sudden you've put on your HCD cap. What they don't know what they need. Let's think about it. In our case, I think we ended up giving them, uh, you know, detail like tax details about the business and the quick route to their next client visit. Right. As soon as they submitted notes. Pretty cool. Salespeople like that. And then the third one, which I thought was interesting and also something that we we take for granted sometimes is. It has to be able to start or complete a process. If they're in dynamics in this case, and we put it, we put the system where they're going to work. We've also made sure it's teaching us two things every time we give it one. We need to be able to click a button to do my job, and that was really important. They they said there should not be a user in CRM that's just using it to view something. They should approve something. They should sign a quote. They should approve an SOW. Um, in this case, it was 
asset approval where they'd go into that Macy's and they'd sell an ad and they'd start designing the ad on their little custom app on CRM and they'd show it to the customer. They say, yeah, that's a good starting point. They'd click the button and it would actually shoot over to the, to the media team. And so simple as that, those three things. And a couple things happen when we, we, we really bake that into the principles of our project. What we found was all of a sudden, if we took those three principles and, and really, you know, I hate to admit, but this was back in the waterfall days, right? So we sat in a room collecting requirements for a month, but all of our requirements had to have those three principles tied to them. How did they fit into those three? Our system got leaner. All of a sudden, the things we were building, you know, you could even argue we might have been doing some HCD and we didn't even know it because the only things we were doing were related to that experience design that the that the media company shared with us. So that's a long winded answer. I apologize. But it, I, I think we really started shifting or for me, that's where I started thinking about, you know what, maybe we're overcomplicating this this whole adoption thing on the technical side. Now, the people side is is complicated, but on the technical side, those three principles, I still use those today. I, I, I'm working with a customer right now building a mobile app, and those three principles are dead center to what we're trying to do. So, so one of the phrases that I heard you mention quite a few times there is experience design. And and it kind of leads to, to where I'm going. We're, we're seeing, particularly in... I want to say post-COVID world, but we're not in a post-COVID world yet, <laughs> um, is that experience design, um, and if we, we translate to the customer experience, is becoming more and more critical for brands in, in market. Um, it's kind of like, <clears throat> like I use the example that Amazon, uh, you know, dot com has set the standard of of e commerce and how you purchase mm-hmm. and how it remembers who you are and it knows you bought this and so if you rate it, you're more authenticated than someone else doing a review. And if another book comes out by that author, they let you know. And or uh, Apple, you know, you can tailor your device to 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 suit your personality. And so there's been a trade for many years between a customer and um and a brand that the customer's given information, you know, simple as their name, maybe the email address, phone number, but a profile has been built over time, often disparate systems. And and the customer is constantly frustrated, and I'm talking about me, is frustrated when I'm <laughs> dealing with a brand, right, that they ask me for stuff that I've given. You know, we've, we've had a relationship for years. I've given you that information over the years. We've been in a relationship. And then you ask me that same stuff again. I'm like, what gives? You know, why, why is that? Or even as simple as, you know, at the shocking level, you unsubscribe from an email list. And the way they run their email list is that they they extract from a database that doesn't have all those unsubscribes in it. And they start marketing yep. you again. Now, even with GDPR and stuff. It's still happening. Um, so we, we come back to experience design and customer experience. Are you seeing that in, in the projects that you're working on these days? That's becoming much more a uh, priority, a uh, a differentiator to drive success and and a successful outcome of the, of the work you're doing. Yeah, definitely a lot to a lot to unpack. But I think a couple of key things that jumped out, especially on your experience, that I think we all share at times, but. Um, this, a lot of, well, let me take a step back. So a lot of my customers, what I'm seeing, and I'm kind of predicting when I'm meeting with my leadership and we're talking about what are we starting to think about from the next 18 to 36 months that our customers are going to start asking us about really when we're thinking about our planning, one of the first and biggest thing that jumps out is our customers own too many things and you hit it with that disparate systems, right? They've They've got customer data in five different places. Um, and th- that's like consumer businesses, let alone when you start getting into um, an insurance company who's collecting data about their customers from about five different angles, right? They've got stuff they get from the customer. They have things they get from brokers. They have things they get from external vendors and external systems. And so what's happening if we're starting to get ahead of that and our customers are saying, we have to reduce our technical footprint, which I I, I think is going to be the next big thing. And, our, and it already is, but I think this is going to be a continued driver of what our customers are going to ask us over the next three years. Hey, I've got, I have nine systems. My leadership has said that I need to reduce this down to one. Help me do that. And so it does two things to your to to your question. One, it's going to drive a better customer experience just by having that as a center of 
the business objective. There's no question about it. You put data in one place, you build a customer profile in one place. That's that's just doing CRM systems well, right? That's that's great. But the second thing I think it's going to do, and this will be interesting, and I think there's some really, really interesting concepts here in the Power Platform, but it's going to force us to start thinking about the customer experience and not the customer experience from uh, you know how my boss wants our customer experience to be, but it's going to start forcing us to think about the customer experience that our customers want it to be, right? And some businesses are already getting that, even non-consumer specific businesses like uh, Humana Insurance, I think does a fantastic job of really putting on their customer cap. And there's someone I've worked with. There's a lot up here in the Northwest as well, Seattle or Starbucks, REI, et cetera, that have kind of figured out the the best customer experience is set by the customer, right? So, and what's cool about that for nerds like us that really get into the, the human centered design, the change management, the soft fuzzy sides of the implementations is we're just going to find that those are going to be as important as the integrations and the JavaScript and the custom app dev. It'll just be another lane of how do we make sure people are going to really like this thing? Yeah, I was on a session this morning doing a live stream with somebody in the UK and I was like, when when are we going to get to the point where the software applications we use in business are addictive? (laughs) Right. <laughs> you know, we can make things like TikTok addictive and, and a lot of consumer different products, gaming, et cetera, addictive. Why can't we have that kind of lens on when we build business applications that rather than, you know, well, that's the way you have to use it rather than, wow, this is so <laughs> intuitive, you know. Uh, yeah. I think Elon Musk said that if, you know, something, uh, if, if you need to write a software a manual for it to explain how to use it, You've done it yep. wrong, you know, and I, I just yep. feel we'll, we'll yeah, come absolutely. from a software world. And I wonder when you're talking about we're going to reduce down on the technology, are you meaning that type of thing? The, the perhaps the complexity. And I mean, and I heard what you said there. I think platforms are going to be a, a big play for companies, you know, rather than having 300 different applications that hold a little bit of something. Uh, that do a little bit of this and and have support and training requirements. That, that, that platforms are going to come to the fore more and more as they yep. simplify, but also unify information. Yep, a hundred percent. And and especially you know this kind of takes us into a different direction. But if you start thinking about like microservices and microservice design led projects, you know. It, I think that makes things really interesting because now we can design experiences for whatever phase that customer and that customer could be external or or an employee is in in their in their workflow, right? So I, I, the best example I always think of is like the Amazon experience where they have I mean, let's make it easy. Three microservices, one for the products when you're browsing those books, looking at the different authors, one for your shopping cart experience, and then one when you actually check out. And the level of the number of folks that get to those three stages is very different, which allows you to build an experience specific to that. And I only mention that because if we think about the world we came from, sort of dynamics, pre-power platform where you had a sales module of CRM, that's like macro service, right? One experience, one screen, one form, that this new world of like modularized applications is going to really allow us to do some cool stuff when it comes to the the human centered design piece. Yeah. So good. So good. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, HCD. And of course, you know, the stuff with Catalyst and Microsoft doing, I think, is um, well and truly overdue, you know, and it's and it's been this yep. pivot they've been on for some years now, been away and moving, you know, and really understanding their customers. Um, one final question I have before I'm going to sure. flick over to some quick fire questions. And so add anything that you want to kind of round out with in this. But the question I have is, how important in your experience has it been to to create a, a culture of whether it's change or a culture of understanding the customer in the team, the practices that you run in that, you know, people really, they, uh, as in like the people you employ and work on these projects, really get their mindset into thinking, you know, like those three guiding principles you talked about, that became your, that became your true north for the project. Everything could be validated in or out against those three things. How do you kind of switch where predominantly in our industry, people that are in it are technologists by background, by DNA, that type of thing. And they've often not looked at what 
what they do from a, how is that individual going to use it? You know, they might even say, well, I'm not a designer, I'm not a creative, and that's kind of creative and design type things. But really, all of us are customers in some form, and all of us need to kind of understand the implications of what we built. And and uh, with technology, I you know I often say you might you know take a shortcut or, or or put a form in a field or something in a form that type of thing that you might take you know five minutes to do, but if it's taking the person using this technology, you know a minute to work it out, and you multiply that by the thousands of users, you know you, you're wasting a lot of time, right? You know that type of thing. How do you how do you create that that Technology culture, the customer culture, the experience culture, design culture within a, a technical industry. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so my favorite question that you've asked because I think as as technologists and implementers, you know, when we talk about waves of what's next and what's coming, this this is not a wave. Like our our mindset shift here is going to have to happen unless unless you're not customer facing, which is pretty rare these days, it's whether you're an implementer or you support your company's CRM system, it doesn't really matter. You're facing customers, you're facing people that are going to use our applications. And so there's a few things here. I, I love it. So number one, and this is when I use a term like change management is a bad word. It's because, I, like I mentioned, we have to ingrain that into the team. Everybody on the team has to be thinking about change management. And what you could sub out, because as soon as you say change management, folks go, oh, no, 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 I'm a developer. I don't, I don't, need, I don't know anything about ProSci. But it, the, the statement becomes, let's think about empathy. Empathy is the key to change management. And as a developer, as a technologist, we have to be able to think about our customer's perception of what we're doing. And so everyone in my team, and I lead our you know digital experience group, everyone on my team better come to me with a, here's how I think the customer is going to interpret this before they give me their pain point or their two cents. And so I think what makes that easy, though, the good news here is that as technologists, we love our tools and we love our toys and we love our the products that we like to use because we spend a lot of our time doing that. So whereas empathy is not an easy skill, it does become easy if I go to a developer and say, hey, think about if I came and took uh, Visual Studio off of your computer tomorrow and gave you a new application to do your job with. Think about the emotions and the feelings and the in the turbulence that this would cause you on the day to day, because that is essentially what we're doing, right? I mean, we're going in and dropping in a new program. We're probably retiring a couple of others, probably more than one. And not only that, we're going to change their workflow too. So Mr. Developer, I'm taking Visual Studio. I'm also going to tell you I need, if you were doing Angular before, now I need React. And also you, you, I'm going to give you the training material to do that. And so if you actually kind of close your eyes and start thinking about that experience, all of a sudden it gets a lot easier to relate and go, what the heck is the customer going to think about this? Let's let's think about that as a team. And I think the culture shift starts happening without actually using the words culture shift, because if you're kind of putting that hat on, it's it's pretty easy to relate. Yeah, I like it. Like that that story, which I transcribed down in my notes here is I'm going to use it. I can guarantee because, <laughs> because to a dev that would be, you know, and then when you said, but Hey, we're going to provide you the training for it. I yeah, can just yeah. imagine a dev going yep. by Hope that it works. point, you know, they popped a cork, you know, it's uh yeah. yeah. I, and I use that all the time because I'm not a developer. You don't want me writing the react training material, which is, that's literally what we do for our customers, right? Hey, Mr. AP clerk, here's your new system. Here's the training material I wrote for you. And then here's the training session that we're going to do. And your other system's gone. We're lucky these people don't start throwing chairs at us in some of these training classes. So true. Awesome. It's been uh, it's been great to to hear your journey, your story. And also, really, I think there's some massive takeaways there. I, I particularly love the, you know, that uh, the guy that took you aside and there's three things that we want to deliver. Uh, I like that. I, I think, you know, you're, you're right on point around experience and, and experience. And then I love that empathy is the key. Um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to use that in some of my training uh, that I've got coming great. up with some folks. It's awesome. Listen, um, uh, before I jump into quick fire questions, do you have any recommendations as a future guest for the show? Yeah, yeah. I meant to think about this, but I'll, I'll rattle off a couple. You want me to give you names? Yeah, give some names. 
It just holds yeah. me to it then. <laughs> so um, uh, first one, Karen June Kuypers. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's in Vancouver, BC, and she was a customer of mine at, a, at one point and has kind of grown and become a change management system implementer. She moved from end user to the consultant side. Her perspective at times is worth way more than mine because she's actually been the person consuming the applications that we built her, right? So, and, and representing teams. Um, super interesting stories with her, I think. Um, and she goes by KJ, but KJ Kuypers. Uh, and then I'll give you another one, um, Billy Frazier. Mm-hmm. And he's with um, another implementer. He's strictly focused on human-centered design. That's that's really his, uh, he's, a, he's a designer by trade. Awesome. And so if you were in a position that you wanted to double click on some of the HCD concepts, I think he would, he's the best I've ever seen at, at really getting into a customer's mind and drawing things in Figma as they talk and then translating it down into real sort of business cadence, I think is really, really fascinating. I love um, it. I'll, I'll, I'll get you to do a LinkedIn intro to them. Um, that would be fantastic. Are you ready for some quick fire questions before we round up? Sure. Okay, here we go. What's the best state you've ever been on? Not who, but the actual events around it, the best date. Um, you know, yeah, this is, this is good. Uh, best date. I hopped in, I have a van, like a camper van and sleep in it. it um, you know, I'm, I, these are huge in, in your neck of the woods. So I know you're savvy on them. Uh, jumped into one of those with uh, my girlfriend and did a two week long national park adventure where we hit every cool park in kind of the middle of the U.S. And it was totally unplanned, literally got in the van and just started, went and picked her up. And it was an amazing, amazing thing. I might add that to my bucket list for the U.S. when you can travel again, you know? Yeah, totally. I like it. What was your favorite subject in school? Uh, sci- I was a science guy. Full full science, any science. If I had to pick one, I'm going chemistry. Nice, nice. Would you rather live in a condo in the city or in a mansion in the country? Uh condo in the city. Interesting. It is interesting, Mark, because I'm stand, I'm looking out my window right now at the Puget Sound Ocean or, you know, right there in Seattle. And I love it. But you said country. Now, if you said anything on the beach, I'm picking that. Otherwise, I'm going condo in the city. <laughs> nice. I love it. Um, boy, you just reminded me of eating salmon there on the Puget Sound. Very nice. There you go. Yeah, wow. exactly. Just, it, t- it took me there. I, I, I've, I've done a, you know, been on some tours there out on the, on the sounds. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, if you had to change your name, what would you change it to? Oh man, I really like Greg, but if I had to change it, um, you know, I'd probably go with something in my family. I'd go with Robert, nice. my dad's name, my dad's dad's name. It, it's, um, that's pretty legacy. Gant name. Is Bob the short name of Robert? Yeah. Yeah. My dad went by Bob. My grandfather went by Robert or Bob, I guess. But yeah, that's that's probably the direction I'd go. Okay. Second and last one. If you could go back in time to uh, your teenage self, what would you, uh, what instruction would you give? You know, this is so time. I literally was just talking about this uh, not that long ago. I think this is kind of a crazy thing. Um, it literally is. I might be three days ago was having this conversation with my girlfriend. When I was a teenager and going into college, I had no idea that there were fun, cool, like majors that you could study in college. I really didn't realize that. I'm a huge baseball fan. And now I read about all these kids that go to college to become baseball statisticians, where all they do is look at baseball stats all day, or park rangers. They go to college to become park rangers. Now, I love my path. It was very interesting. I love my path. But gosh darn, if I wouldn't have traded international business for uh, looking at baseball stats all day in a, in a heartbeat. I love it. Last one. You walk into a cafe. What's the order you, what, what drink do you order? Well, anyone that knows me, can answer this one because I'm a bit of an addict. I'm a I'm a Starbucks venti cold brew with a little bit of milk, no sweetener, probably once a day. Uh, and I have been maybe for the last uh, five or six years. At times, if I'm spoiling myself, Mark, I'll get a cake pop, but that's really the the extent. And you saying you add milk to a cold brew? 
little bit, just a splash of milk in there. It's a little softer on the stomach, I think. Yeah. Okay. I've prepared the cold brew just, you know, straight up. Um, yeah. Greg, it's been great to have you on the show and uh, I appreciate it. I'm going to make sure I put all your, you know, if people want to get in touch with you. Um, thanks again. I look forward to this being published. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. I've enjoyed it and I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Business Applications MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as NZ365Guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me or uh, on LinkedIn, best way to get hold of me. If you'd like to subscribe, do so on your favorite podcast player. If you want to leave a review, go to nz365guy.com forward slash review. Otherwise, see you next time and stay safe out there.